It's probably no surprise to anyone who knows me, but I love musicals. Musicals, and in particular their film adaptions, were one of the most abundant and significant sources of entertainment for me growing up. From the great RKO musicals of the 1930s with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, to the MGM classics with Busby Berkeley dance numbers, and seriously, who didn't watch the 1965 Sound of Music at least a couple hundred times? Whether they were in black and white or glorious technicolor, the dancing, the set design, the elegant attire, and of course the music, I found to be a gentle invitation into a vibrant, safe, and happy world. Many of these musicals followed a fairly predictable storyline, which went something along the lines of character introductions, song, two people meeting, a song, those two people falling in love, more songs, some sort of conflict, followed by a song that both resolved the conflict and ushered the couple into a happily ever after. But even though these plots were similar, I found great comfort in the dependable storyline, and of course, the happily ever after. No matter how bad or dire things look for the stars of the show, it all worked out in the end. Loose ends were tied up, mysteries were solved, Justice was served, and our heroes went on to live that happily ever after, sent off with a climactic orchestral crescendo of music and the beautiful cursive writing of the end. Musicals were the ultimate form of suspended reality and entertainment. Do you ever notice how funny it is in a musical how a character could be just talking, maybe in the middle of nowhere? Yet all of a sudden there would be an orchestra in the background and the main character would go right from speaking into singing. Ah, this was entertainment. The clown with his pants falling down over the dance. That's the dream of romance or the scene where the villain is mean. That's entertainment. Many of the great musicals of the 1940s were produced during World War II and served as a much needed form of escapism for a world devastated by the horrors of war. And while I didn't grow up during that time, I could very much relate to the fact that the world represented in these musicals was certainly comforting. Growing up, life wasn't always nearly as song-filled, joyous, and fair as it was in a Broadway musical. The so-called real world could be a much more scary, dangerous, unpredictable, and messy place, with uneven plot lines, unresolved character conflicts, and rarely those neat and tidy happily ever afters. Even storylines and beginnings and endings were difficult to discern. Entertainment has evolved over the years, and Broadway shows are no exception. In many of these early shows, characters and plots were described as a bit shallow and two-dimensional. Greater character depth and exploration became more and more popular in mainstream entertainment and in Broadway musicals over the years. Characters became more three-dimensional. Conflicts weren't always resolved. Those happily ever afters weren't always guaranteed, much like in real life. And this is where I can see a connection between the evolution of Broadway musicals and the way we can evolve in our faith and understanding of the Bible. Now, Bear with me on this, because I imagine at least some of you may be able to relate to this experience. When you think about those old Broadway musicals, and what could feel like a bit comforting, yet shallow and two-dimensional understanding, sometimes I felt the presentation of God and scriptures also paralleled that comforting, yet shallow and two-dimensional aspect. In particular, I felt this way when I was presented with the idea that no matter what happened in this world, or to me individually, that it was all part of God's big plan. And just like in a musical, it would all work out in the end. Those times when I, or those I cared for, experienced great loss, pain, hardship, or tragedy, there was often an attempt by others, and in most cases very well-meaning, to attempt to sum those experiences up as it was all meant to be, or it was just all part of God's plan, like a plot device that was moving us all towards a happily ever after. But for me, and for many folks I know, that happily ever after never really came. 
This is where we quickly move from the shallow comfort of these musicals to the very deep waters of theology and biblical interpretation and can quickly find ourselves in over our heads. Because when we as humans attempt to explain the complexities of God working in the world and speak on behalf of God, why folks, that means trouble right here in River City. And that starts with T and that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. And if you didn't get the reference, it's to the musical of the day, The Music Man, one of my all-time favorite musicals. The Music Man was a famous Broadway musical that became a Hollywood film classic as well. In 1957, the Broadway show won an impressive five Tony Awards, including Best Musical, beating out West Side Story the same year, and ran for 1,375 performances on Broadway. The cast album won the first Grammy Award for Best Musical Theater Album and spent 245 weeks on the Billboard charts. The musical has been brought back in various stage and film adaptions over the years and is currently set to hit Broadway again, if all goes well, later this year with none other than Hugh Jackman playing Professor Howard Hill. Now, the musical hasn't completely aged well. Two notable examples are the complete lack of diversity among its cast and a male-female dynamic that feels dated at best. Yet, the music band remains a classic. It's fun, upbeat music, relatable characters, and the way it deals with topics such as relationships and community that are relevant in any culture make it a show that has stood the test of time and is often referenced to this day in pop culture. The musical setting is River City, Iowa in 1912. Interesting, at the time of its creation, 1957, that 1912 was portrayed as a much better and more innocent time before two world wars, a Great Depression, and a global pandemic. But it's funny to me because it's much like pop culture today in which shows like WandaVision will satirically portray the 1950s as a much better and more innocent time. The, the movie version of The Music Man became a huge hit. The movie starred Shirley Jones, who found out during filming she was pregnant, to which the producers had to keep creating bigger and bigger costumes and continually film her from further and further away as the movie went on. And while the studio, Warner Brothers, wanted Frank Sinatra for the lead character of Harold Hill, writer Meredith Wilson insists that Robert Preston, who portrayed the role on Broadway, do so on the film as well. And much like Robert Downey Jr. seems to have been born to play the role of Iron Man, it seemed that Professor Harold Hill was a role that Robert Preston was born to play. Ah, good old Professor Harold Hill. Well, how could we describe him? Harold Hill. Hill. Harold Hill. Well, he's a music man and he sells clarinets to the kids in the town with the big trombones and the rat-a-tat drums. Big brass bass, big brass bass and the piccolo, the piccolo with uniforms too, with a shiny gold braid on the coat and a big stripe running down. Well, not to spoil the story if you haven't seen it, but Professor Harold Hill was a traveling salesman who made his money by getting people to invest in uniforms and instruments to form a boys band. And despite Professor Hill's less than noble intentions at the start, starting a boys band with having no actual education or experience as a band leader, his character evolves as the musical progresses. There are some songs, he falls in love with Marion the Librarian, and without even knowing a note of music and employing a teaching method he describes as the think method, the surprise at the end is the community actually does come together to form a boys band. And even though they weren't perfect, the parents were proud and, to no surprise, all worked out in the end. But where does this leave us, and how does this relate to our lives when so many of us seem to be denied that happily ever after that we so desperately are looking for? And where does the idea come from that God is in control and working all things for good? Well, one of the scriptures that's most often referenced here is Romans 8, 28. We read, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Now, at first glance, we could interpret this standalone passage to mean that for those who love God and for whom God is called, all things work together for good. What this means and how we experience it as God's people has been examined by many of the biggest names in Christian history and theology. So 
bear with me as I attempt to summarize 2,000 years of theological scholarship on this passage in two minutes or less. About 200 years after the time of Christ, early Christian scholar and theologian Origen of Alexandria saw all things working together for good to refer to all of God's children being redeemed in the end when creation is liberated and Christ's kingdom comes to pass on earth. The focus on all things working together for good is one more in the corporate sense rather than the individual. So the circumstances in each individual believer's life won't necessarily fit into a coherent pattern of good. In contrast, famous Christian philosopher Augustine saw the passage referring to the individual rather than the corporate sense, and that circumstances in the individual believer's life were all part of the believer's spiritual journey towards salvation in Christ. Martin Luther and 12th century French philosopher Abelard saw this verse in light of predestination, where God had already ordained everything that was to happen. 20th century Swiss theologian Karl Barth was similar to Origen in that he interpreted the passage in a corporate and end time sense, but unlike Origen, he saw all things working together for all of humanity, not any specific identifiable or quantifiable group of people, as Barth was very much against the concept of election. He said, we as humanity are not allowed to specify who is within God's love, so that all things would work together for good for all of humanity. Later 20th century theologian E.P. Sanders, who represented the new perspective on Paul, saw God in this scripture as doing something of cosmic significance and affecting all things, but that individuals will be affected differently depending on whether or not they were believers. And 20th century Chinese theologian K.K. Yeo finds a parallel to this scripture and the concept of heaven in Confucianism. His interpretation states that not all things serve the comfort of the people of God, but all things work together for their salvation. God does not cause everything, but God uses every event, good or bad, toward an eventual greater good. Whew! So, what is our good news from all of that? What can we take out of all those perspectives? Or, boiling things down to what I think is a much more practical question, what in this passage can be helpful for us in those times of need when we or others we care about experience tragedy, loss, and are seeking help and answers? This is where we can take a more careful look at our Bibles, and a small detail may provide the key. We don't often spend much time focusing on the footnotes found in our Bibles, particularly the New Testament. The reason for this is most of the time the footnotes contain notes that don't necessarily provide a major significant change in the way we would interpret a passage. In the translation of the Bible that we use most frequently, the NRSV or New Revised Standard Version, for example, we often see footnotes noting their use of more gender-inclusive language for God or humanity, as opposed to the more masculine language found in the original manuscripts. But if we look at the footnotes of this scripture, we find something very interesting. Because we know it says, Romans 8.28, other ancient authorities read, which means that other versions of the manuscript read that God makes all things work together for good, or... In all things, God works for good. In all things, God works for good. This is a case where the footnote can shed a completely different theology on the entire passage. If we use in all things, God works for good, we take the focus on why things might happen and put the focus on God working in light of what has happened. No matter what the reason whether they're preordained events that lead to a cosmic salvation or whether it's just individualistic paths to salvation, it doesn't matter. The why isn't the focus. In all things, God works for good. More and more, New Testament scholars believe this footnote holds the key to a much better, much more encouraging, and much more Christ-like understanding of this scripture. Instead of our focus being on God's orchestration of events happening, what if our focus becomes, how is God working for good in light of all things? And, maybe an even bigger question, what is our role in working with God in light of all those things that happen? 
In this case, we can turn to Paul for, to answer this question. Because what is God's embodiment in the world? Us. Paul tells us that we are the body of Christ. We are God's hands and feet. And in the end, in all things, it is in and through community that we experience God working for good. Now, it's hard to believe, but Elizabeth and I have been part of this congregation for over 15 years now. And a lot's happened over the years. And in our times of greatest challenges and needs, I can say without question that we have most experienced God working for good in those things through this community. It has been in the community working together that we most experienced God's love. One of the main reasons I love the Music Man is that even though the community itself experiences its share of challenges, what mattered most was the community coming together for good in the end, unified, working together to create something beautiful. In all things, God works for good. And God works for good through God's people. During this pandemic, we have experienced horrific tragedy. Tragedy that for many has changed us as individuals and as communities forever. But in all of these things, we've also experienced beauty. When we look deeper, we could see God working for good in light of the tragedy. We saw that in the way people rose up and cared for one another. Much like the community in River City coming together. In the end, it was the community working together for good, either through massive humanitarian efforts, through standing together against injustice, or simply through the kindness shown to other people. We could see God and experience God moving in our midst. Horrible things happen. This is a sad reality of life. And however we may have tried to make sense of the reasons they happen, it doesn't make them any less horrific. However, I do believe there is good news in the scripture for us. And that good news lies in all of us. If we are the body, if we are God's hands and feet in the world, and if in all things God works for good, we represent God working for good in the world. And while the complexity of God is far beyond our human understanding, I know that we experience God moving in the midst of our community. Friends, fellow hands and feet of God, we have a lot of work ahead of us. We have questions to answer as to how we will be the hands and feet of God moving forward in a post-pandemic world. What does that mean for our leadership, for our building, for our priorities, for us as a community, and for us as individuals? But as brethren, and as this faith community, we shine being the hands and feet of God in the world. Whether that's caring for those in our community, caring for those in our congregation, or caring for those around the world. In all things, God works for good. And we experience God moving in our midst, loving each other with heart, soul, and mind. And if you don't mind me saying so, that's even more beautiful than 76 trombones. Thou Spirit of God, go with us down from thy holy hill. Walk with us through the storm and the calm. Spirit of God, go thou with us still. Touch thou our hands to lead us aright. Guide us forever, show us thy way. Transform our darkness 
Break from our feet the fetters that bind. Lift up our lives, the weight of our wrong. Teach us to love with heart, soul, and mind. Spirit of God, thy love makes us strong. Kindle our hearts to burn with thy flame. Raise up thy banners high in this hour. Stir us to build new worlds in thy name. Spirit of God, O oh send us thy power. That postlude was from annual conference 2018 where uh, the Church of the Brethren body came together and uh, sang the very popular hymn, Move in Our Midst. And when I think about this idea of God being with us and God moving in our midst, I, I love the imagery of that, that uh, several thousand folks getting together of all different backgrounds and uh, some very differing views, but just seeing uh, that group come together and join voices in harmony is just a great representation of, of how God can move in our midst and how beautiful things can happen in light of tragedy.